Hello. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Uh, am I audible to you guys? Or just uh, no, put in the chat if you're hearing me or not hearing me. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks uh, for, for, for your attendance today to support uh, Ministry of Testing. Uh, today we have uh, Poven on board to share with us um, the, uh, let me show, I haven't shared my screen actually. Yeah. Hi Poven. Hi. Hi everyone. Yeah. So let me share my screen. See how it goes. Right. Can you guys see this the uh, screen share? If so, yep, leave a chat. All right, great. So you can see the screen share. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, sorry, I started a bit late, but it is intentional because uh, I want everyone to be in a social launch, launch to you know just talk and everything, I explore this uh, tool. And later, I just wanna have a feedback. You know, if if you feel that this is a good app uh, to continue our meet up with. I personally feel it has like good good uh, features like social launch and we also have a backstage for speakers to you know have chat and everything. So that's why I'm, I'm like uh, just con really interested to you know have feedback from you guys about this tool. So uh, welcome to the meetup of Ministry of Tetting, uh, Kuala Lumpur, meetup number seven. So, uh, oops. Ah, okay. I'm your host today, uh, Ameh. So if you guys want to you know, speak anything, we have a live chat going on the screen. So feel free to, you know, to just type in anything there. You can also raise hand to you know speak. Uh, then probably I think I can allow you to speak and you know, ask questions or anything. All right. So here's our agenda for today. So I'm going to do our normal introduction about uh, mystery of testing and everything. And after that, I'm going to hand over to Poven to give for his sharing of test automation pyramid. Okay, that's uh, what we're going to learn today. And then afterwards, after the talk, we're going to have our 99 seconds talk where everyone can share what they feel about the topic. Or if you want to have any questions that Poven want to ask, uh, you want to ask Poven, then, you know, feel free to say so. All right. So uh, just an introduction for everyone. Uh, this is a Ministry of Testing website. Uh, they, they are our sponsors for the for the meetup today. Um, as you all know, this is uh, one of the like the site for testing for our uh, to learn everything about testing over here. There are four ways we can interact with the website with the site. Okay, with, with Ministry of Testing. First is to learn on the dojo. Dojo is like a, it's like collection of articles and you know, tech tech, uh, tech uh, I wouldn't say tech talks because there are videos as well. Uh, so it's about learning about testing. You can go to the dojo. Uh, there are free uh, free articles, but I think majority of it is paid. So that's where you can join uh, and be uh, one of the like um, con uh, contributors. Oh, no, no, no. Can be, you can join in and be a member. Yeah, sorry, be a member. And uh, you know, you can see the full article once you become a paid member. So you can also connect with the community via the various uh, channels over there, which I'll share in a while. You can also attend the events. Uh, there are a lot of events coming up, which I will also share in a while. And lastly, if you are like, uh, if you're, you're feeling it, you can also contribute to the ministry. You can contact the team and you know, send in articles or you want to do podcasts and share the podcast. Yep, feel free to do so. So that's how we interact with Ministry of Testing. So uh, one, this is one of the uh, latest emails, uh, email the news, email newsletter that I received from them. So this is something that I highly recommend to everyone, for everyone to join in at least. Uh, subscribe to the email newsletter and you get this. Uh, I know every week you get some nuggets, small nuggets, small useful tips about testing, articles where you can click and read on Ministry of Testing. Uh, this is something I just received. Uh, uh yesterday <coughs> about automation week coming up uh, at the end of this month and uh yep they, they have 
I see, as you can see at the bottom, they have like automation challenges. If you want to feel like taking on this challenge to learn more or, you know, just deepen your knowledge about API testing and everything. So do subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, next, we have the Slack channel with over 11,700 people joining. It has a lot of uh, good uh, discussions, uh, art sharing of articles as well as, you know, uh, things associated to Ministry of Testing, uh, like announcements about events and everything. So do join the Slack channel and you know, explore all the channels available there. Definitely you will learn. And we also have events coming up. These are snippets of some of the events we have in this month. Uh, I think the biggest events we have is the Test, test Bash. Uh, we have Test Bash Netherlands coming up this weekend. We have the workshop and conference day. Uh, and then we also have the uh, test bash online at the end of the month, which coincides as with the automation week. Yeah, theme of automation week. So do join in. Uh, they have uh, various uh, membership plans, but I think last uh, last two three months they have introduced a new plan called the Pro Plan, which is payable monthly. So you if you know certain months you feel you want to learn something, you can just subscribe for the month absorb all the knowledge and everything and then once you're done maybe you can unsubscribe and then later on if you feel like it you're joining another month and then continue on continue on paying monthly okay so i think that would cost about 24 pounds i guess so yeah just go to the website and check out the links to subscribe yeah uh, okay so before we start i guess some community principles i would like to remind everyone uh during the meetup uh please uh, be kind, be human, meaning that uh, listen and absorb everything. But when you want to share uh, your opinions, everything, be respectful respectful of opinions, you know. Uh, be supportive and inclusive and lastly, be open-minded, right? So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Poovan to the stage, you know, to do his sharing for the topic today, which is, uh, which is sorry, Ooh. Test automation pyramid. Uh, so over to you, Kuvan. Okay. Thank you, Amir. No problem. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, it's appearing for me. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm Poen. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the Ministry of Testing, Cal, for giving me this opportunity, wonderful opportunity to be part of this. Um, so before I proceed, how's, how's everyone doing? How's, how's everyone dealing with the pandemic so far? Yeah, I think everyone's not looking forward to MCO tomorrow in KL, but I guess we just have to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah things, are, things are a bit challenging with uh, remote working now. Yeah, and yeah, more, more to learn, right? Okay, right. Um, just just a brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm I'm attached to AppSpace as a test automation practice lead. So we basically develop platform um, that integrates with digital signage, um, room room scheduling, collaboration tools, and other tools that allows people to connect and work together. Right, um, the, the company is based in US and the, there's a development center in KL, local in Malaysia. Okay, and that's about me. So without further ado, let's jump into the topic. So today's topic is about test automation pyramid. Okay, so as we all know, um, software applications tend to undergo constant evolution and changes, right? So day by day, more and more features will be added um, and thus this increases the testing effort. So in order to cope up with this, test automation, the, the, the approach called test automation got introduced and it started to get common in the, in, in the industries for about more than a decade. Okay, and I believe there's one key concept uh, to be successful in automation, which is called the test pyramid. Let's move to the pyramid. Okay. So in summary, this is the pyramid. As you can see, 
the foundation, the base is actually consists of unit tests. Moving up to the pyramid, we have the integration tests. Above that is end-to-end -end tests. And lastly, manual tests, right? Um, so the, the pyramid is divided into multiple layers to depict how much or how extensive amount of testing needs to be done at each layers. As we go down the pyramid, the test has more isolation and tends to run faster because of less moving parts. As we go above the pyramid, if we have more integration is in place and test tends to get runs slower, which we shall talk more detail in about this in subsequent sections. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me in the middle, yeah? All right, okay. For, for the upcoming slides, I'll be having, I'll be basing this sample application to be an example. So this is a high level structure of this application. We have a typical um, API, which is called a, NAS, a new service. And this new service has a database as a storage. And it also have some dependency to the news providers called, for example, BBC and CNN. Okay. And the client can make use of the service to read some news, you know, get some updates and so on. This is the typical use case. Okay. Straightforward, isn't it? Okay, let's jump or let's drill into further of the new service. We have the controller for the new service, which is responsible for to handle HTTP requests and the responses back to the client. We have this repository um, to interact with the database to, to interface on reading and writing information back and forth. On another hand, we have the client. The client is actually responsible to interact with the third-party provider, third-party services like BBC, CNN, and so on. Not to forget, we have the domain to capture business logic uh, and the domain logics. Okay, this is the typical microservice example. Okay, let's see about unit tests. So as we saw just now in the pyramid. Unit tests is the foundation. Okay. They can, uh, on a typical object-oriented programming, they can range from a single method in a class to an entire class. So for example, in this scenario, the units can be controller, repository, client, and domain, domain classes. So if we are referring to single page applications like Angular, the components uh, in the UI can be units as well. Okay. Okay. How do we test the units? We can test units with base by making use of test doubles, which such as mocks and stubs. So depending on the scenario, we might use mocks and stubs. So there are some differences between mocks and stubs. Stubs is like a it's like a fake version of a dependency, whereas mocks is is almost similar to stub, but it, it has only specific usages. There's, there's more, uh, we can read, but more about mocks and subs in online. Yeah, feel free to explore that. Um, what, what needs to be tested in unit tests? So all public interfaces of classes needs to be unit tested. So for example, there's class A depends on class B, right? So we can actually mock the class B and pass that instance to class A to test the behavior of class A. Like we can supply some inputs to class A to see how that behaves or responds accordingly. All right. Um, I also would like to uh, suggest or to consider this approach called test-driven development. It is a very good uh, approach that, that has a different perspective in terms of development, right? It, um, so for example, rather than solving the development problem from problem point of view. Uh, it allows the, uh, the developers to approach from the test point of view. Uh, it is a separate topic as a whole, which I don't want to cover a lot. So just, just to give some summary on that. Um, so, for, uh, so for example, there's this feature called A, feature A. So a developer typically can write the test cases for this feature first. So without the feature, the test cases would fail. 
So they will start to implement the feature based on these test cases. And then as they progress, the test cases will pass. This is like the high level of test, test, test driven development. All right. Um, yeah, so this helps to have a better coverage in terms of feature and, uh, and the functionality. Okay, so let's move to integration test. Okay, so we, we saw how a unit test works and what it does. So basically, unit test will, will mock or stop the, the dependencies to test the internal logics. So they tend to run faster, right? And the, the behavior of that is that they don't cover the integration of the actual dependencies. Like for example, we have the database and the race APIs. They don't test that. It's not their responsibility. It's the integration test responsibility to do that. Okay. So it so integration tests will help to test all the parts that live outside of the application. Okay. So in order to do that, we need actual instance of dependency to be tested. So for example, uh, we need that. So, so for example we have this database so we can have database that can run locally like local databases local mysql local mongodb for example okay uh, for cloud for cloud storages they are emulators available for azure for google cloud they are emulators that we could make use of okay so aim to run external dependency locally like self contained in a local environment so it, you might ask, there might be some questions like, okay, we have the database locally. How about the REST API services? Okay, I'll come to that. Um, for these kind of scenarios, to, for the third-party services, well, typically you can have a fake services that behaves close or similar to the third-party services, right? So why why we want to have that, okay? That, that actually leads to the advantage. So which is to give confidence that our application can work correctly with all the external parts. So these tests, this test tends to be slower than unit tests and harder to ma maintain and write. Okay, that is because we have more moving parts now, right? So we have the external dependency. We need to, we need to find, find about how to spin up them, how to do data preparation, and also like, Doing some cleanup at the end of the test. Okay, those those parts we need to take care to do that. So we we could actually make use of some like um, um what you call like a container based container based services to to have the environment set up. Like we could probably make use make use of Docker uh, to do the environment setup. Like we can have the MongoDB or MySQL instance locally. We can also have like some other services to be self-contained, right? Um, integration tests, typically how, how we execute is that um, we set up the infrastructure or the services. We invoke certain part of the code that will call the, that will, that will make use of the database or the external dependencies. Like for example, repository classes. We can target the repository class with an actual connection string with the database, the local database, call the methods and test whether are they behaving as, as expected. Okay. Right. Let's move to another section. So end-to-end -end test, which is the which is located on another level above integration test. Oh. End-to-end test typically helps us to verify the application behavior as a whole. So in this case, we have the sorry new service. The end-to-end -end test in this case helps us to verify the whole service whether are they behaving as intended. So in this case, the entry point will be on the client, which will simulate REST API calls to interact with the service, the API. At, in some cases, there will be a UI or a, or a user interface sitting in front of the API that behaves as the client. So in this case, the end-to-end -end test will cover from the UI point of view. 
right? And yes, it will be tested with a deploy instance of actual services to verify the production readiness. Due to the nature of uh, the, the instances and the services, we, because we have more moving parts, these, tends, these tests tends to be slow and flaky. Okay, um, so for example, we have a UI test, a UI end-to-end -end test that covers a user journey, right? Sometimes the UI can be a little bit slow, or browser some might the browser that we are using might have some quirks. So because of that, these tests, these tests potentially will be sometimes will get false positive. So that's why we need to have less amount of these test cases. That's why, hence, that's why they are above in the pyramid. So, all right. So rule of thumb is that we should be testing the high value user interaction with the application journey. And it's strictly not for all sort of edge cases, right? So all the edge cases, we should be testing on the previous uh, cases like unit tests or integration tests, for example. OK. Um, so what, what I meant by high value user interaction in this case is, for example, so in our use case, new service, a, a typical user journey might be like the user might be logged in to the uh, from the UI, and they would potentially refresh the feed, and they would be like they want to read some news, right? They want to read some news, they want to get some updates, and then that's all. So that if you, if we manage to cover that flow in the end-to-end -end test, that de depicts that okay, our service all the UI, the service, the dependencies works as intended. It, that is on end-to-end -end tests. Okay. And I don't have a slide on manual tests because the session is about automated tests. So I, I, I just do a, I just share some brief information of manual tests. It, the manual test is located at the, at the top of the pyramid, which means that we should aim to do less of this, okay? As we all know, manual tests is always like, uh, is, is like redundant, uh, is, is considered redundant and then it uh, in quite, it, it, um, it has a lot of, it needs a lot of efforts and time to do that, okay? Okay, what can be manual tested, right? Um, so we can ver verify some things manually, like whether how a UI is being displayed, whether is the placement of the components are, are correct, are they appearing correctly in the UI, um, how, how is it getting rendered in the UI, and so on. Even then, those kind of scenarios can be tested with uh, cross-browsers. Like They are like cross-browser tools that allows us to capture how an application or UI will be rendered on different browser on, and across different versions or different views, for example. like an UI uh, can be viewed differently in mobile or uh, a full-fledged desktop or laptop. So we can capture those rendering, and then we can review that manually with some, with some help from the tools. OK. So that is on the manual test. OK. I have some key points and considerations here. So we have went through all the different types of testing, test cases. Um, and I would suggest always try to aim to run the automated tests in the continuous integration or the continuous delivery pipelines. Okay, having those tests in your local environment, is it would definitely not going to help for the fast feedback loop, right? We need those tests um, to be run somewhere, uh, probably a, a better, a, in, a, in a pipeline to have a better visibility and a feedback. So if something fails, like for example, we have a we have the unit test and integration test as part of our check-in or continuous deployment. When some when something breaks, immediately we will know like, okay, there's something breaks, like what can we do about it? What breaks and so on. We would get immediate feedback. Okay, we can correct things earlier as possible. Okay. The second point to note is that try to avoid duplicated tests across the layers. 
and also if possible consider pushing test the down push, pushing the test down the pyramid okay like for example when you are doing when you are doing some end to end test when you are writing some end to end test scripts at that point of time if you happen to know that okay hey this test case we can cover in integration test or unit test yes please do so if if that is possible please move the test down the pyramid as possible because again as the test goes down the pyramid they tend they tend to run more faster by running the test more faster we get earlier feedback and fast, i mean we get earlier feedback and we can correct things faster okay that is on the second point point is that always aim to write in test code so in 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 some organizations uh, they tend to be like the 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 automation tends to be like uh, fully on codes like be it like .NET, Java, Python, Ruby, and etc. So, test code is important as production code. Please keep please bear this in mind, right? So, um, when an author writes it, sometimes down the road, another person may come in and then they will start to maintain it. Okay, if the test code is clean. It's easier for maintenance, right? We 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 do see the benefit of that, right? Okay. Um, whenever it's possible or applicable, try to use some design patterns in test test codes. Like we all know that design patterns um, help us to uh, have a better design, and also maintainable test codes, maintainable codes, right? Yeah. And that's uh, one of my suggestions. Right, and yeah, that's about it on my session. And these are some references that you can refer on the test automation permit. Right, uh, I think I ended earlier. <laughs> so, do you have any? Do you guys have any questions for me? Right, that's a good. Uh, actually, that's a good uh, presentation on on uh, test pyramid. I have a few questions I'd like to ask, but if uh, anyone has first question, you can also you can click on the raise hand button so that I can probably uh, let you speak. There's also the questions uh, section you know, where people can drop questions there and then, you know, uh, if it's the same question, then you can just upvote the question so that it goes to the top for Boven to answer. All right. Okay. I think one of the things uh, I want to ask you is that um, uh, how do you... I mean, I, I like the idea of pyramid, but one of the things I, I, I the challenges I face is like um, uh, the developers, right? Okay. We, we always want to build a stable base for the pyramid, but development team or in, on in my experience always ha always does not have enough time, maybe resources or uh, anything else to actually do you need tests in a proper manner. So I would say the base of the pyramid is not as, as you know, as big as it should be, you know. In some instances, my end-to-end uh, -end tests are much longer or bigger than the unit tests that have been done in, in previous projects. So how do we tackle this problem, actually? Okay. In your, your experience, yeah. Okay, um, that's... Uh, there's there's no uh, right answer for this. I'm I'm answering based on my experience for this. So it it's it starts with the mindset actually. Okay. So when developer writes their code, they can spend a little bit of time to write the unit test of that. So like like for example, uh, we we like like uh, if I were to ask you how how's the software development life cycle? Is it are you guys following Scrum Agile? Or how's the process like? Is it like waterfall? Um, uh, I, I guess my experience was in agile because okay. uh, my, 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 the things the the reason that they always give is that they don't have time to do that, and it's also okay. not enforced if we follow the agile uh, scrum way. It's not enforced as a DOD, you know. So that's why they like okay, I'm not, not going to unit test. It's not something I need to do. Mm -hmm. So so yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, got it. So 
in this kind of uh, use cases or scenarios, we normally, if I were to approach, how, how I would do is that I would try to approach the management and let them, the management, uh, or for example, the scrum masters and so on, um, to, to highlight the, the importance or advantage of having the unit test. Right? I'll try to convince them first. So after that, once they are convinced, then I will try to bring down the information back to the team. Like, okay, hey guys, we need to have, we need to do man, um, unit testing, right? And there might be some uh, that they don't have exposures on unit testing. So that potentially we might need to like arrange some sessions or training sessions, whether is it uh, internally or externally, that depends. Okay. And we also need to start this from the, a grooming or estimation session point of view. Like when, uh, when we have this feature to be worked on or to be sized, um, on top of development effort, we also need to include the estimation effort to write some unit tests. Okay. It, it, it has to start from there. Then as slowly, when, slowly as we start to do that, uh, the developers will see the benefit of it, right? Or from QA point of view or from testers point of view, we also can approach uh, on a way that, like for example, um, let's say the developers, after they pass the code to the QA or the testers, let's say this, there's a lot of bugs into that. Okay, we can also try to cover from there. We can, we can try to talk to them like, hey, hey, you see all these bugs that have escaped to us. You could also test this in unit tests. You can, uh, if you have that it covered, um, it's much more easier for us to continue testing. All right. Yeah, that's, that's how I uh, view this challenge. Do, do you think that will help? Yeah, I think it's, it's sensible that we approach uh, authorities, eh? Mm -hmm. Authority figures to like you know enforce something, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's, it's it's good that we also go to the angle of you know uh, linking back the advantages of doing unit tests so that you know people mm -hmm. can really try and absorb. I mean, not absorb maybe get their heads towards that you know so that they start doing the unit tests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, uh, everyone is a team, right? Yeah. The developers and testers, we work as a team to deliver the, the deliverables, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's more on like collaborating, like how to how to do our jobs better. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right, so I think we, you can open the chat section there. There's a okay. question from people as well. All right. Um, Saif, yeah. Okay, Saif. How much should be the code coverage for unit tests? Any benchmark? Ah, uh, okay. Okay, again. There's uh, there's no uh, there's no specific figure for this. In my previous experience, uh, in previous companies, um, we tend to set seventy five percent as a benchmark. So that is given that the company is matured matured in terms of automation process. So for some, some for some companies, if they are starting to have like unit tests, so probably they can have. My suggestion is to like have a a benchmark of like maybe fifty percent. Like fifty percent of the codes needs to be tested. Yeah, that's that's my suggestion. Um, another point to note is that code coverage doesn't indicate um, doesn't indicate a quality test, right? We can just write a a, a, a simple test that runs through the code, and then we can have hundred percent of coverage. So that that shouldn't be the scenario here. Uh, we should be always like consider from the test case or scenario point of view in terms of unit level that that will help to write better or quality unit test cases. That's my thoughts. Mm, yeah, yeah, quite agree with that. So, uh, we, uh, I think the the way we, I mean, to put numbers, it would suggest that you know people can just do uh, tests that are just like. Just to fit the numbers, right? Yes, so, yes, like, exactly. Tests, you know, integer tests. Whereas we should be having more higher value tests to to mm -hmm. not just to 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 you know to give value, not just hit hitting the benchmark. Yep, like, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I think one more question I have from from my side is that um, mm -hmm. 
in terms of the <coughs> test data, right? When you have a uh, test data going, I mean, we have tests going to the continuous delivery part when you mentioned. How, what's the best way in your experience to generate the test data needed? Okay, do you mean on the integration test pipeline? Yeah. Or on the pipeline, it doesn't matter levels of tests. It's just that if we run tests to the test to the pipeline, what's the best way to generate the data needed? Yeah. Okay. Um. To generate the data, we can probably uh have some codes to do that. Uh. For example, if you want to generate data in the database, you can probably have a, a CSV file that is with the test data or different um what we call a different different unique data that you want to test, you can iterate through the data and then pump the data into the database with some initial code base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably that will help. Um, we normally will have, we'll use CSV or JSON files to do that. So the code will typically read the file, iterate through, pump the data. But, uh, be it database or be it a REST API, it will just pump the data. And, and then after that, only then the real test will start, right? Start. Correct. Okay. Correct. And the end of the test, we should make sure to delete off the resources. Okay. Got it. Mm. Yeah. So that it doesn't grow every day or something like that. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, any more questions from the floor? You know, feel free to just dump the live chat or you want to speak. Let me know. Okay, I guess that's for now. Uh, thanks, thanks, Wovan, for you know, sharing your knowledge and experience on this. Uh, it, is, it is a, a good talk uh, for you know, people who are experienced and as well as beginners alike. Right. Let me share my screen now. Okay. Uh, share screen. So now we come to the so like second section of the uh, event, which is the ninety nine. I mean, uh, ninety nine second talk. This is something that you know we have in every in every sorry in every uh, meetup we have. So we let you know people from the floor to speak up on anything on the topic or off the topic you know let's speak about your day it's fine as well but you have 99 seconds to talk so that's why one, one of our like um, yeah so one of our <laughs> signature events this is in every uh uh ministry of testing events as well so so yeah anyone want to talk or you know share anything Right, ending mic over. Hello, okay. Hi, Azam. So, hi. Yep, so, feel free to speak about. We have 99 seconds from now. Okay, so earlier we talked about the coverage, like what is the ideal coverage for unit test. Um, so in my team, we have like a range of like 75 and 85 so we have like it depends on the like risk associated with that microservice so sometimes we can like set higher for high risk and lower for low risk um, components and also the code coverage can be measured in different ways we can have like line coverage or branch coverage yep. but those are very hard to hit sometimes because with the exceptions sometimes those code are not meant to be executed at all maybe for error handling of course we can like raise the exception in the unit test but sometimes it's hard so we have to be realistic with the code coverage target another thing is on the how to generate data for test automation there are some libraries that is called like faker so faker we can generate like different data based on the field that we want maybe we we want to have like different names addresses those can be generated by faker it is available in every language and should be pluggable to any test automation framework that we have. I think that's Good. all that I wanted to share. 
Cool. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good. Good information, bro. Azam. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. What? What? One more thing. Uh, uh, I'm interested to know what you do with situations like you can't test a code because it's just for error handling. Do you normally push to test that, or you just you know leave it there to test? No. Uh, we have a discussion with um, developers whether it is like worth to spend time on that or we can just add it, accept it as a risk to make it like to leave it untestable ah okay all right yeah so that, that's interesting because you know <clears throat> these other conditions are sometimes really hard to to simulate you know so yeah it's good that you say you have a discussion or something yeah yep all right thanks problem just within the time limit <laughs> okay uh, anyone else want to speak i think you want to speak just click on raise hand and then from my side i can give you the mic so to speak so that's what azam did just now yeah so yep anyone want to like uh right okay, have another one raising hand all right giving the mic to saif Hi, Saif. Uh, yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And your 99 seconds begins now. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my question is uh, really very short because I think uh, uh, from my previous experiences, I have heard developers saying that, okay, if we are only writing unit test cases, that should be sufficient uh, for the regression suit. And other, like, if any new functionality or feature is coming, we can just do uh regression testing or manual testing so i just want to hear your opinion how is it um so if, if i want to understand correctly uh that it's like the developers were saying unit test is sufficient for regression is it uh kind of it will uh, prevent further bugs we don't need to write a ui test cases okay um so okay I would actually counter argue with that if I if I uh, if I were to do that uh, because unit test ensures the code features works correctly right uh, mm -hmm. each, each of the expectation of classes work as intended whereas UI tests also have its own benefit because in actual world multiple classes will work together multiple modules will work together to form a function or feature we still need to have uh, UI test or an end-to-end -end test to verify this journey or the flow, the workflow, is working as intended. Uh, yeah, that that's my uh, thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Yep. Any more questions, Saif? No. Uh, no, I think I'm done. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time. All right. What's wrong? Right. Any more? I uh, know. Reason. Okay. So opening the floor to one, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. So, yep, uh, that's it for our 99 seconds talk section. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you, Bubun, for your time and thanks everyone uh, for attending the talk. Uh, we started uh, a bit late, but that's intentional uh, for you guys to enjoy the social launch and you know, just speak to each other. So, uh, let me share our next event, will be uh, on 10th November. Uh, it will be online. And, you know, uh, welcome speakers, volunteers, and also anyone who's interested to sponsor us as well. Okay. So with that, I would like to thank everyone again uh, for your time. And thanks, Fuben, for your sharing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, with that, I wish everyone a uh, safe, um, I don't know, safe day tomorrow or whenever. <laughs> yeah. So ha have, a, have a good night. And... Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.